Okay, it's my deep, deep pleasure to introduce Professor Sandra Matthews to you. Uh, Sandra Matthews is a uh, professor at Hampshire College, where she teaches film and photography. And uh, she is also the editor, the founding editor, I believe, of the online uh, journal on photography in Asia. Is that the correct title? Trans-Asia Photography Trans Review. <laughs> Trans-Asian Photography Review, which maybe you'll talk about today I will, a little bit, I, I will. think. Uh -huh. And I know that um, Sandra has a special relationship to the center. She was a research associate here a couple of years ago, about <laughs> many years ago. I think close to 20. I was oh, 20, <laughs> one yes. of the first research associates. Uh -huh. about 20, Right. But, um, and uh -huh. I'm hoping that you notice when you walked mm -hmm. in that we are lucky to have the, uh, one of her photographs to exhibit here, um, and that's a lovely arrangement that I'm very grateful for. And I know that we, we get many comments about your work, Sandra. Mm -hmm. People come and they stand in front of it and try to figure out who's who mm -hmm. in the photograph. Mm -hmm. And so it elicits a lot of discussion about multi-generational relationships, which is a topic in Sandra's work that I think she'll be talking about today. Um, Sandra is uh, also a prolific writer. And in addition to editing the journal I mentioned, she's also um, been part of a number of writing projects, including um, a book that came out in 2000, co-edited with Laura Wexler, called Pregnant Pictures, which is a cultural history of photographs of pregnant women in the US. And we have a research associate coming this spring, Meredith Nash, who was heavily influenced by this book. So I think that's a wonderful connection as well. Um, she also has written on topics that really raise questions about not just the cultural history, but also the politics of photography. And she frequently asks the question, you know, what are the photographs that I'm not seeing? And I think that's a really mm -hmm. crucial question, mm -hmm. particularly for women um, in this day and age of over inundation of visual images, and, and, but there's so much that's still missing. I just wanted to mention two of her um, essays on this subject. One is called In Defense of Civil Rights, the Paradoxical Power of Family Photographs, which was written in response to a controversy here in, in this area about um, exhibiting photos of LGBT families. I think at the Amherst High School, I believe. Was it the high school? I think so. I think it was mm -hmm. the high school. And then um, an essay on, uh, called Courage in the Face of History, Cross-Cultural Portraits, which raises questions about uh, cultural survival in the aftermath of war and also the depiction um, of this aftermath of war by um, women photographers. Um, I want to say that I uh, feel very lucky to know Sandra. I've had the pleasure of visiting her studio and hearing in depth about her project on mothers and daughters. So I'm really looking forward to, to hearing you. about your work today. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for being here. Thanks. Thanks. Well, it's, it's really great to be here. This is such a special place, and I'm deeply appreciative of Karen's leadership, her inspired leadership here, and her commitment and recognition of the importance, importance of media and the arts, um, which has been such an active part of the, the program. So, and, and I also greatly appreciate Nairi's, um, the beautiful way that she takes care of everything. So, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Karen and Nairi invited me to speak today about my work, and I'd like to speak about two distinct projects. Um, the first is the, the TAP Review, um, or the Trans-Asia Photography Review, a journal devoted to photography from Asia. And the second topic is my personal photographic work, particularly the Timelines series. And I'm very honored to have one of the prints hanging here. It feels like a very meaningful place for it to, to be. I'll link both of these projects to the theme of women and photography. And I hope you'll chime in with comments or questions at any point. I'd like to actually start out with a very quick thumbnail sketch of the history of photography as I see it. Um, thinking also of the question, what, what don't we see? Uh, photography was officially invented simultaneously in France and England in 1839. It was clearly an idea whose time had come. There are reports that it was also invented at the same time by a Frenchman in Brazil, 
a German, and by two Chinese scientists, one rumored to be a woman. Immediately after its invention, photography spread from England and France to other parts of the world and was, was developed scientifically, commercially, and artistically by men and some women in many locations. Yet much of this history is missing. Until the 1970s or later, and still, um, there were and are huge gaps in the way photo history was and is being written. Vernacular photography was left out, collage and multiple image work was left out, this is all prior to the 70s, and the work of women was sorely underrepresented. But most shockingly to me, the entire non-Western world was left out. Taking the situation of women, we now know that in the Western world, the new medium of photography was surprisingly open to women compared with other art forms or other professions. In England, for example, Anna Atkins published a book of cyanotypes or blueprints in 1843, just four years after the invention of the medium, demonstrating uh, its scientific utility. And 20 years later, Julia Margaret Cameron began exploring photography very seriously as art, connecting with paint painterly and literary traditions. By the late 1800s in the US, middle class women were actively using photography in entrepreneurial as well as artistic ways. Jessie Tarbox Beals, who started her career in Western Massachusetts in Williamsburg and Northampton, was the first woman photographer to publish her work in a newspaper in 1900. And also around 1900, Gertrude Kazebeer, a successful portrait photographer, sold a print of this image for $100, apparently the most that had ever been paid for a photograph at that time. So at the turn of the 20th century in the US, women were being thought of as both producers and consumers of photographic products. The Kodak Girl ads, which started in the late uh, 19th century, portrayed young white middle class women as going places, even if in this case um, she is teetering on the edge of a precipice. Um, it, women photographers could now embody social mobility, something everyone wanted. But it is important to realize that most of the work of early women photographers never quite entered history. Some of it was written about in the journalism of the day, but not again until the 1970s at the earliest. In the case of early African-American women photographers, Jean Mutusimi Ash's book, Viewfinders, first brought some of their work to light in 1986. Unlike cinema, photography remained untheorized for a long time. While initial writings about the medium were often narrowly technical, once photography was thought of as art, the focus of writing became narrow in other ways. The first book that discussed photography as art was published in 1937, almost 100 years after the medium's invention in 1839. I'm talking about Beaumont Newhall's work entitled The History of Photography from 1839 to the Present, which remained a classic for decades. It established a kind of artistic chronology for photography, which was useful in many ways, but it focused almost exclusively, at least initially, on white male Western photographers and on straight photography as an aesthetic. Perhaps the presumption inherent in its title that it was the history of photography was part of the problem. It seems more useful to think of photography as having many histories. As a counterexample to Beaumont Newhall's work, I'd like to mention the more recent work of the late amateur historian Peter Palmquist since he's not as well known as he should be. In his spare time, he created an enormous archive of information about women photographers, which he stored in a shed in his backyard in Petaluma, California, eventually making it a huge air-conditioned shed that people came from all over the world to uh, research, do research in. And the archive is now housed in Yale's Beinecke Library, where it is called the Women in Photography International Archive. He also self-published, before self-publishing was easy or popular, a number of books working to assemble a multi-vocal record of the photographic work of women. And this is just one of, one of his books. And I'm just going to pull up now the, um, the Tap Review site. Let's see, let's 
Oops, should be underneath. I was, I figured this would happen. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, oh, it's underneath. I had it just underneath. This is the site of the TAP review, and um, the point here is that it was not only women who were excluded from photo history until recently, certainly male photographers were excluded as well, depending on the fashion of the day, but hugely, as I mentioned earlier, photography from the non-Western world was also absent. Japan is a notable exception to this problem of the lack of information about non-Western photography, and I should just mention it briefly, because individual Japanese photographers became known internationally in the early 20th century, and the Japanese have been chronicling and analyzing the history of photography in their nation ever since the medium was brought there comparatively late in 1853. However, hardly any of this writing has been translated into out of Japanese. Um, so it's not accessible to non-Japanese readers. Um, amazingly, the first scholarly book in English about photography from Asia was not published until 1997. Um, this is Christopher Pinney's Camera Indica, The Social Life of Indian Photographs. A second pioneering book on non-Western photography was also published that year, Deborah Poole's book on Andean or Peruvian photography called Vision, Race, and Modernity. Apparently, by 1997, the study of non-Western photography was, like the invention of photography itself, an idea whose time had come. The increasing appearance of scholarly work on photography, photography from Asia inspired me to start the TAP Review as a way to encourage continued research and writing. And here we have it. Let's scroll down a little bit. Uh, and you can see Ajay Sinha's article right here. Uh -huh. And we have articles, book reviews, symposia abstracts, recent publications of note, uh, research, uh, resources for research. And um, if you want to hear about the next issue, you can sign up at the email sign up. And if you want to go to past issues, um, you can just click there, such as to our special issue on women photographers. Um, technically, anyone can start an online journal. It's quite wonderful and amazing. Um, the harder part is to keep it going and to make it good. The TAP Review is an open access, peer-reviewed journal. We publish writing on photography from Northeast Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and beyond from all parts of Asia. Our international editorial board um, is wonderful, and it includes four faculty members from the five colleges, Ajay Sinha, Tony Lee, also from Mount Holyoke, Sam Morse from Amherst, and Young Min Moon from the university. We're entering our fourth year of publication, and we're officially published by, as you may have seen at the bottom, by Hampshire College in collaboration with the University of Michigan Library, and we're just now receiving support from the Five College Consortium as well, and so that's going to be added to our, our footer there in the forthcoming issue, which is coming out in about 10 days. All right, but what does all this have to do with women in photography? We have found that although many of the authors we publish are women, the photography we have been receiving and publishing in the TAP Review has been overwhelmingly made by men. I've asked curators and historians in Asia about the invisibility of women photographers, and most say that women have entered the field only recently. There are definitely exceptions to this, but overall, it does seem that the situation for women photographers in Asia has been historically more difficult than in the West. However, since the history of photography in Asia is just beginning to be written, really, we don't yet know the whole story. I would speculate that one factor making it more difficult for women might be that photography was brought to Asia in the context of colonialism in most cases. Unlike in the West, photography came to Asia already connected to a hierarchical power structure, and this may have made it more difficult for women to enter the field. 
we made women's photography our theme for the spring 2012 issue of the TAP Review, and I'd like to give you a glimpse of three particularly interesting essays. We'll do it, go back to the PowerPoint. We want to go to previous. Click on. Oh, just the. Um, ah, okay. There, Thank and then you. maybe go back. If oh, it came to just to the. I want to go ahead. Okay, so perfect. Thank you. All right. So we'll take a look, a, a, a brief look at, at three particularly interesting photographers um, who were represented uh, by writers in, in the TAP Review, two from the special issue on women and one from a guest issue edited by Youngman Moon on the After Effects of War. We'll start with Lady Herb Bonag, whose work was featured in an article by Leslie Woodhouse. Um, she worked in early 20th century Thailand. Um, Lady Herb was together with her four sisters, one of King Chula Longcorn's 153 consorts. This was apparently a position of privilege and status. King Chula Longcorn was famo famously interested in photography and made cameras and a darkroom available at the palace. I should mention also that Thailand is the only Southeast Asian country that has never been colonized colonized, so his interest was um, more out of choice than it, it, it might have been under other circumstances. Lady Herb lived in the women's quarters of several different palace compounds and documented life there as a kind of embedded reporter. As both the king's consort and an active photographer, she represents in her person a transitional cultural moment using new technology within a very traditional social role. In addition to photographing what seemed like everyday palace life, she also elaborately staged photos. Um, in this case, she's photographing uh, another member of the, uh, um, another consort uh, named Dara Rasami who was a member of a, a minority group, a Lao minority group, and had very long hair. Um, and actually, Leslie Woodhouse, the author, uh, makes an interesting point that she thinks Lady Herb is actually exoticizing her in a whole series of, of, of photographs that she did showing Dara Rasami unwinding her long hair. Um, they're amazing photographs, um, but she staged them. Here's actually her set. Um, it, it looked like it was just in a dressing room, but it's a dressing room that's been recreated outdoors to take advantage of sunlight. Um, and here, when we see Dara Rasami approaching on the right uh, side with her hair all still tied up. Uh, Lady Herb's most famous photograph was one that wasn't staged, however, and that's of King Chula Longcorn cooking on the on. Uh, on the porch, um, stirring something in a wok and smoking, wearing a very simple wrap. Um, and this uh, photograph apparently did the equivalent of going viral at the time. And um, it can still be seen in many Bangkok restaurants, although King Chula Longcorn is no longer alive. Um, and photographs of royalty are, are uh, common, commonplace in public places in, in Thailand. But um, this particular photograph is still circulating um, it, as an intimate view of the king. It, it, it domesticates him in a kind of endearing way. So I think we could say that Lady Herb used feminine access to the king, um, both to promote her own career and his popularity. Oop, and now, we're, so that was Lady Herb's work. And now we're jumping to um, another country and another time. This is Homai Virawala who was the first photojournalist in, in the first woman photojournalist in India and worked in, we're gonna look particularly at work from the 1930s and 40s, although she worked, had a much longer career. And her work is featured as part of a curatorial project um, written by Sabina Gadihok, a scholar based in New Delhi who's on our editorial board. I was privileged to hear Homai Virawala speak uh, about four years ago um, in Boston. Um, she was in her late 90s and very articulate. Uh, she just died a year and a half ago at the age of 98. 
and had photographed many subjects, but um, this curatorial project focuses on a seldom seen group of pictures, and um, Sabina Gadihok describes them as um, being representations of the emergence of the modern girl uh, in the 1930s in India. The figure of the modern girl combined glamour with educational opportunity. Um, Homai Virawala herself was a modern girl, and so she's basically documenting her friends and classmates here um, in art school. Sabina Gadihok tracks these images, appearing first in the 1930s and then disappearing in the 1940s as India's independence approached. At that time, um, she says that these images were seen as undesirably westernized and more traditional ideas of womanhood were emphasized instead in service of the new nation. Um, so here in 1946, we see um, uh, photographs made by Homai Virawala of women in traditional clothing learning the, the duties of a hostess at um, Lady Irwin College. Uh, so there was a, a cultural shift with the appearance and disappearance of these photographs of the modern girl. Homai Virawala ended up making an important record of the transition to independence and photographed many key figures, including Gan Gandhi, Nehru, and their families. Um, when I heard her speak, she mentioned that she felt her own ethnic identity as a Parsi in India uh, was an enabling factor that helped her become a woman photographer. The Parsi community um, apparently had more liberal uh, social views about um, the role of women, and so she, she felt she had a lot of family and community support for um, her professional life. We'll now see one more photographer. Um, oh, this is a kind of famous picture of her from the 1950s. Uh -huh. um, we're jumping now to Japan in 2010 and the work of Yamashiro Chikako, uh, whose work was featured in an article by Ayelet Zohar, who's also a member of our editorial board um, based in Israel. Yamashiro uh, is a, a young artist in her early 30s, 30s and she's from Okinawa. And you may know that Okinawa is a bit separate and distinct from the rest of Japan, that it's an island um, uh, that's a little further out uh, geographically, and in fact it was a separate nation until being annexed in the 19th century by Japan. Then it also was occupied by the U.S. Um, after World War II. So it's had a difficult history, and particularly the World War II history is very difficult. The Battle of Okinawa is uh, famous because there was a situation in which Americans were closing in. Um, and Japanese soldiers on the island um, forced Okinawans to commit mass suicide, many of them. So a very traumatic um, history. And Yamashiro's work is obsessed with this history, actually. She's done a number of works that address it in different ways. And she's also done a lot of work with elderly Okinawans who still um, have some memories of this time. So this project is called A Chorus of Melodies, and she's taken older people and younger people into the forest and it had them um, lie on the ground in close proximity. Um, there's a sense of strangeness and Ayelet Zohar, the author, talks about the shadows in terms of camouflage, but um, there's a kind of fragmentation um, and obscuring that happens with the shadows. It's unclear quite what emotions are being expressed if this is a, a a picnic or uh, uh, something else, and um, a sense of dis uh, disorientation and dislocation. Zohar writes that Yamashiro's work is about the overshadowing of traumatic memories, that the shadows represent this, and that she's indirect, indirectly invoking history, painful history, and its after effects. So these three photographers come from the three main regions that the Tap Review covers, Lady Herb in Southeast Asia in the early 20th century, Homai Virawala in South Asia in the mid 20th century, and Yamashiro Chikako working in Northeast Asia now. They also represent an important range of political stances. Lady Herb humanized the Thai royalty from an insider's point of view. 
whom I was an observer of huge social and political changes, and Yamashiro photographs in a subjective, metaphorical way as still as a comment on national history. Our knowledge of women's photography in Asia is still very fragmentary, so I'm giving you these three fragments that are not really related to each other. Um, we look forward to publish, uh, publishing and analyzing more work by women photographers in the TAP Review. In fact, in the forthcoming spring issue, we plan to translate from Bengali a work written in the early 80s about early women photographers in India. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch now to talking about my own work um, in this two-part uh, presentation and uh, specifically about the Timelines Project. So this is the most recent image in the series. And the Timelines Project is a series of portraits of women made over time. I've been working on it for the past six years. But let's back up for a moment and talk about portraits in general. Portraits are an old and deep form produced in many media. They are considered so powerful that human likenesses are forbidden in some religious traditions. Photographic portraits have their own special ghostly presence because they can so realistically call their subjects to life. Making portraits is a process of collaboration in, in which both the subject and the photographer have power. Although the photographer may have intentions regarding the meaning of the photograph, the presence of the subject in the image can assert itself in contradiction. Portraits depend for their meaning on rendering the expressive qualities of the human face and body. We've just hung a, work, uh, a show of work by Sage Sawyer at Hampshire College. It'll be up for the month of November, and she'll be coming to speak on November 14th if you're interested. It's a series of portraits of individuals suffering from partial facial paralysis. Um, Sawyer's compassionately looking into the situation when an individual's ability to express emotion through the face is compromised when the two sides of a person's face each express different things. I'm going to show you a few more examples of different kinds of portraits. Portraits are rarely just about an individual. They're also always social documents as well on some level. This is more obvious in some portraits than others, as in this photograph of a minor made by the Chinese photographer Liu Zheng. We understand the social dimension of the image by seeing the man's obvious injury and learning that he is a minor. We put it together. As social documents, portraits are grounded in specific moments of time, but this can be ambiguous. Hampshire alum Kelly Anderson Staley has made a series of contemporary portraits of Americans coming out in a book um, any day now using the Civil, era, Civil War era tintype process. The physical qualities of these portraits, for which her sis sitters have to hold still for several minutes, resonate with both past and present. Portraits can also be grounded in fantasy and myth. Japanese photographer Miwa Yanagi asked several young women to imagine what they might become in 50 years. The photographer then staged these fantasies um, using, I believe, the, the women themselves as subjects um, and using a lot of theatrical makeup. And she called them collaborative portraits of the ideal elderly woman. These images remind us that performance is almost always an element of portraits. We tend to think of a photograph as a singular slice of time. In my own work, I've been especially interested in extending the single image, representing more than one moment and more than one space simultaneously. I'd like to show you now the work of several artists who explore this idea of presenting more than one portrait simultaneously. Taryn Simon's project, entitled A Living Man Dead and Other Chapters, investigates what she calls bloodlines. Each set of panels takes an individual with a curious story of some kind, tells that story in words in the central panel, and traces the bloodlines of this person on the left, documenting his or her extended family with blank spaces for individuals who could not be photographed due to illness, incarceration, or other reasons. 
on the right are other related images and texts, kind of like evocative footnotes. This particular set of pan panels here represents the title story, A Living Man Declared Dead, about a man in India who was declared, India, was declared dead by his relatives so that they could take his land. Another set of panels, for example, shows the bloodlines of the first woman hijacker. So she picks compelling subjects, and um, this was shown at, at uh, MoMA in New York about a year and a half ago. And there is a book, a, a giant book that's a kind of a limited edition book of, the, of this project. This pair of images from Dawood Bay's recent Birmingham project commemorates the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama by the Ku Klux Klan 50 years ago. The bombing killed four young African-American girls. Here, Bay sought out and photographed Birmingham residents who were the same age as the girls were at the time they were killed, as well as residents who were the age the girls would be if they had lived. And the project serves as a kind of living memorial. Dutch photographer Rineke Dijkstra's series of portraits of a young Bosnian refugee, Almerisa, is a chronological sequence. And this is an excerpt. There are many more images than these. It's a uh, condensed version. Um, it's, the project started when Almerisa first arrived in the Netherlands and shows her acculturation and coming of age in the ensuing years. In a project like this, the temporal space between the photographs becomes an active element. Turning to my own work, I've been exploring multiple images since the late 1970s. In these two early examples, I used a mask made of torn paper to make single images that incorporated two spaces and two moments at once. I also explored multiplicity and simultaneity in a number of other ways, but um, more pertinent to the present project, I began a series of portraits of women in 1989. At the time, I felt that the different parts of my life were in conflict with each other, as you can see in this self-portrait. I wanted to photograph other women I knew in their multiple roles and see those parts of a life side by side. I photographed my subjects in a set covered in collage newspaper, the newspaper representing public space as a background to my subjects' private lives. After making a number of these images, I felt they were not going where I'd hoped and set them aside. And almost 20 years later, in 2007, I rediscovered them and began to think about them differently. Isn't that kind of, there we go. In relation to time, I was still in contact with most of the subjects and tried updating the portraits with new newspaper back backdrops. I switched the images to black and white to allow better continuity between old and new. And combining images over time, there was more of an implied narrative. The newspaper backgrounds took on new meaning as markers of time and also as signifiers of the many different kinds of stories in an abstract way that might intersect with the subject's lives. As the project got going, I began to also update earlier and later images that did not have newspaper backgrounds. The amount of time between the two sides of the image now varied widely from months to decades, and this seemed interesting. In fact, although these combinations move from left to right chronologically, I think of their sense of time as more circular not simply linear. I've chosen these particular subjects among my family, friends, and acquaintances because I'm moved by who they are. They all have powerful stories to tell, which may be partially suggested in these pictures. Collectively, they have experienced illness, violence, disability, and loss, and also have grown, met challenges, and thrived. I see them as courageous survivors, and I hope this feeling of survival comes through in the pictures. Some of my subjects like their pictures and others don't, but have allowed me to use them anyway. I'm grateful to my subjects for being willing to stand for my camera to present and reveal themselves over and over again. It generally takes me months, if not years, to find the combination of images that feels most resonant. So it's a long, a long process. 
There are several themes that weave their way through this project. One is maternity, which I attempt to address from different points of view and at different stages of life. I'm very interested in generations and what gets passed on from one generation to the next or not, in how the past shapes the future, and how we can see this, or imagine we do, registered in faces and bodies. Of course, I have a personal interest in how women age. I'm fascinated when parents and children resemble each other, and when they don't. I'm alluding to the complicatedness of caretaking. What binds mothers, daughters, and granddaughters to each other? or keeps them separate. I'm aiming to communicate complex emotion, but with restraint. While the timelines are at heart portraits of individuals, I'm also thinking, as the project extends over time, about what these portraits add up to collectively. I do think of them as social documents. Taken together, the timelines allow me to connect to my own historical period, a period in which women's issues have come to the fore. They certainly do not present a comprehensive view of this period and couldn't. Rather, they are a record of some of my own encounters with other people, a gathering of images from the point of view of one person, me, who has lived through the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st. Photographing people who are both older and younger than myself allows me also to extend my historical period a bit. I'm currently thinking about different kinds of texts that could accompany these images and welcome your input on this. And throughout the project, I've been very fortunate to be working with a local printer named Stan Scherer, who's um, helped me finalize the image images and made the final prints. And I'd like to close by saying it's just truly a privilege to share with you the projects I'm working on the TAP review and the timelines, and um, both projects are ongoing, so I would really welcome your suggestions for any future directions they might take. Uh.